Well, welcome everybody to the uh, the next day's worth of the uh, ASGBI uh, presentations. We've, as you know, we've been doing these for the last few weeks, been well received, and today we have a number of people presenting their papers, mainly on the topic of esophagogastric. I'll be help, helping to moderate together with Liz Gemmel. Um, I'm a consultant surgeon in Nottingham University Hospitals, NHS Trust, with an OG subspecialty interest. And Liz, did you want to introduce yourself? I do. I'm an UPGI, uh, but I'm a consultant up at Kings Mill, so just north of Neil. A couple of um, things to say. First of all, keep your eye open for the announcements about the Moynihan Academy. That'll be um, something aimed primarily at trainees interested in um, the generality emergency general surgery. And um, we've got a couple of more paper series next week. I think our last uh, papers is on the 2nd of September. And please, you're very welcome to come and join us. So I'd like to start off with our short papers. Um, and the first one is by Edward Nevins and entitled One Anastomosis Gastric Bypass results in superior weight loss when compared to Roux and Y gastric bypass. Edward, would you like to tell us about your uh, study? Uh, thanks, thanks for the opportunity to present. Um, I, as as uh, has been mentioned, uh, we've looked at one anastomosis gastric bypass and compared this to our results of Roux and Y gastric bypass in our bariatric patients. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as many of you will know, one anastomosis gastric bypass is an alternative to the traditional Ruan Y gastric bypass and in theory has benefits related to a shorter operating time. And as there's only one anastomosis, uh, it's likely to result in fewer complications. Um, but despite the growing popularity worldwide, there remains a view that uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass may be inferior to Ruan Y with regards to uh, malnutrition, marginal ulceration, and predominantly uh, biliary reflux. Uh, so here I aim to show the evolution of uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass in James Cook Hospital and compare the outcomes with our Ruan Y patients. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we keep a, a departmental database of all gastric bypass patients, uh, and specifically this is looking from our patients between 2014 and 2016. We separated these patients into two cohorts, uh, those that were operated before 2016, where we did not perform many one anastomosis gastric bypasses, and a post-2016 where the surgery was more common. Uh, we looked at their outcomes at their 12 month follow up appointments. And importantly, all patients, uh, as is standard, underwent a tier three weight loss management program, and all patients had laparoscopic surgery. Um, excess weight loss was calculated uh, as per the equation you can see uh, there, which is it's a standard uh, method of assessing weight loss following bariatric surgery. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here you can see uh, that during this time frame, we had a total of 537 patients across, across the 36 month period. And the left uh, table demonstrates that we had a predominance of female patients uh, in both cohorts, so 81% and 82% respectively. Uh, the type of bypass, uh, the proportion of one anastomosis gastric bypass increased from 5% up to 29%. Uh, across the two cohorts. And as you can see from the table on the right, in both cohorts, the excess weight loss was increased in the one anastomosis gastric bypass patients and was slightly uh, higher weight loss, so 81% compared to 63% in the uh, 2016 cohort uh, when comparing one anastomosis to Ruan Y gastric bypass. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, as, as we've demonstrated, um, one anastomosis gastric bypass is a safe alternative to Ruan Y gastric bypass. In James Cook, its use is increasingly common. Um, here we've demonstrated the efficacy of the procedure and it justifies its use as a mainstay of anti obesity surgery 
And then the last point demonstrates the safety of the procedure. We've only had two, uh, during this time period, we only had two major complications, uh, one of which was a return to theatre um, due to a post-operative bleed from recovery, and one was a late abdominal wall hernia, which, which required another operation. Uh, thank you, and I'd like to invite any questions. Well, thank you very much indeed. Nicely kept to time. If I can just start off with a couple of questions. If anyone has questions, please um, put them on the QA uh, chat thing and then I can, we can ask them. So why not just do a sleeve? Since your gastric bits, it looks incre incredibly like a sleeve. Uh, so a, a sleeve is predominantly a restrictive operation and um, we we we've actually got a cohort of sleeve patients and our uh, which I haven't presented today and our excess weight loss is not as not as good as the malabsorbative procedure that we get with the um, with either of the bypass uh, bypass patients. The sleeves often dilate as well, so um, we find that there's a proportion of patients that don't lose uh, lose weight and certainly don't continue to lose weight in the long term after the sleeve. So that brings um, but, on to the other po technical point is, what's your uh, length of um, bypass? Has that changed over this historical control period to give you your apparent excess weight loss? Uh, so we do have, we have two bariatric surgeons who, who tend to stick to a, uh, uh, a same uh, limb length. Um, in the Rouen Y, uh, patients, we uh, stick to 150 uh, BP limb and 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 a uh, a length that is uh, comfortable for the elementary limb that comes up to the gastric pouch in the Ruan Y patients, which we tend to see is about 50 centimeters. In the one anastomosis gastric bypass patients, we uh, again it's it's two meters to 150 uh, centimeter. Uh, BP limb or, or BP loop in the one anastomosis gastric bypass, I should say. Um, so they're fairly similar. Um, they're fairly similar bypass lengths. Um, but again, I, I do agree that, that it may be that there's a marginally longer BP limb in the one anastomosis gastric bypass patients that may, may be the reason that we are experiencing excess weight loss. And then the last co uh, question from Ahmed. Have you looked for the effect on diabetes or other such comorbidities? Uh, so we haven't. Um, the, well, we'll the, leave it there at that for the moment you. if you haven't. Thank, thank you. you very much. Liz, do you want to take on for the next one? Yep, thanks very much. That's a great talk. So the next one is the role of cannabinoids and the treatment of gastric and esophageal cancer by Ahmed Salah. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks for giving the opportunity to give this talk. So um, you can move on to the first slide, please. So um, this is um, part of a PhD project, which has unfortunately been mostly derailed by COVID, but had managed to get some results by the time this was submitted. And the, the part of this, this part of the project was to um, determine whether the um, non-psychoactive cannabinoids, CBD and CBG, um, had a cytotoxic effect on a panel of gastric and esophageal cancer cell lines. Um, so we can move on to the next slide there. So a bit of background to this. So um, gastric and esophageal cancers still have a relatively poor um, survival when compared to other GI cancers, such as colorectal cancer. Um, many patients um, aren't fit for surgery or chemotherapy at presentation. And many of the current cytotoxic and chemotherapeutic agents have uh, side effects that are sometimes unacceptable for patients and um, there are uh, if we can find any novel agents that can be used to downstage a disease or use in the palliative setting that could be beneficial so we've used a panel of cell lines which I've uh, listed there so there's two esophageal and three gastric cancer um, and then a bit about cannabinoids so they're, they're naturally occurring chemicals that are present in the cannabis plant they can also be synthetic and they're also found in the human body and they're known as endocannabinoids. Um, and there have been some recent changes in the legislation um, and the law that have, that have sort of paved the way for cannabis and cannabinoid-based research. Uh, next slide, please. So methods-wise, um, cell, the cells that we use are maintained and subcultured as per the guidelines from ATC, uh, ATCC, which are the people who provide the cells. 
Um, cells were grown in 9612 plates, which are, are standard for these kind of experiments, and then treated with a range of concentrations of CBD and CBG. And then after 96 hours, we uh, looked at the viability and assessed the viability of the cells using MTT assay, which is a, a well-validated colometric assay, which is quite commonly used to, to check for um, drug effects on cells. Um, experiments repeat at least three times, and um, the viability was calculated at each concentration, and IC50 was calculated at, at the end, which is the, the IC50 is a concentration which inhibits 50% of the cell growth. Uh, go on to the next slide. So, oh, it's not showing up very well there. That is not how I sent it in, but anyway. Um, so you can see that the cell line, so on the left, we've got AGS, N87, SKGC2, and the, the other two cell lines that I mentioned. Um, and overall, we can see that um, when all the results are combined, as the concentration goes up from uh, 0.2 micromolar to 100 micromolar at the, the other end of the spectrum, we get inhibition of um, cell activity. Now, it doesn't tell us whether the cells are um, dead or dying or whether they're just not taking up the MTT, which is what is used for the assay. And that was the kind of next bit of the project we've not quite got to. But on the whole, um, the CBD, which is the um, one in blue and the CBG, um, both inhibit the cells and they're, they've shown that consistently across the cell lines. Um, and we've seen similar effects with the with using cisplatin and 5-FU, but those need a lot lower concentrations. So the next bit of this is to look into um, combination studies between these and the, the pre-existing chemotherapeutic agents. Uh, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Fantastic, really interesting stuff actually, and looks very promising. Just sort of a quick question. I know cannabinoids, my limited knowledge, also have an immunosuppressive role. Did you look at anything other than the cytotoxicity effects? Um, we, we've not got that far actually, because the project wasn't very far in before COVID has closed the lab and it's been closed since March. So um, I know there's some, there, there's some research into that and it, that you know, cannabinoids have been used for, um, people have tried to use them in MS to try and quell down the immune response. And um, there's some research looking at cannabinoids in IBD but we've not um, looked at that as part of actual experiments um, at this moment in time. Yeah. And is it being used quite extensively in things other than gastroesophageal cancer? Um, there are similar projects that have um, gone on in the university and that I'm aware of looking at um, ovarian cancer, where we've seen similar effects and in breast cancer. Um, there are a lot of papers on this kind of thing, but mainly looking at um, very, very potent synthetic cannabinoids, which would be unacceptable in human use because they're things that basically, would, you know, they've got very strong psychoactive effects, whereas CBD and CBG don't have any psychoactive effects. So they would possibly be uh, acceptable for, to, for use in patients in this kind of context. Great. And I think you've been let off any other online questions. So unless anyone <laughs> has them. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, good luck with the improvements as COVID settles. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that. Um, obviously, early results, um, but I'm glad you managed to get something out. So our uh, next uh, presentation is um, Ahmed Salah, gonna, uh, no, sorry, Kirstine McSween, going to tell us about the effectiveness of NICE guidelines in detecting esophageal cancer from direct-to-test endoscopy. And I think most of us who do this should have a very clear idea of how many tests we have to do. So Kirsten, tell us. Hi, thank you. Good evening. So my name is Kirsten and today I'm going to present some work I carried out while working as a junior doctor in general surgery at Paisley's Royal Alexandra Hospital. So for this project, we endeavoured to assess the effectiveness of the NICE guidelines in detecting esophageal cancer from direct test endoscopy direct to test obviously being where GPs can directly refer to endoscopy without the prior requirement of a surgical or gastro assessment based on guidelines um, published by NICE in 2016. Next slide. So the aims of our research um, were to use the NICE guidelines shown on the right hand side of the screen there. So detailing the concerning presentations that would merit a referral for direct test endoscopy and whether this should be done on a routine or an urgent basis. So our primary aim was to assess how effective um, these guidelines were in detecting esophageal cancer. 
And we also um, aim to calculate the number needed to test identify esophageal cancer and to identify the common symptoms at the time of presentation where esophageal cancer was detected. So this was done as a retrospective study of all the referrals um, with their reports um, from the endoscopies um, over a one year period um, at our hospital. Next slide. So in this time frame, 1,105 endoscopies were carried out as a result of direct test referrals. Esophageal cancer was detected in 22 of those individuals. So of all those 1,105 referrals, only 65% of, um, of those referrals were actually appropriate based on the NICE guidelines. So one in three being an inappropriate referral. However, for the 22 individuals where esophageal cancer was detected, every single one of those referrals met the criteria for endoscopy from the direct-to-test guidelines. Over 90% of the individuals with esophageal cancer met the guidelines for urgent referral, with the only um, individual meeting the guideline for routine referral being the one with new reflux and no additional symptoms. So of the patients where esophageal cancer was detected, our data collection confirmed that the commonest presentation of esophageal cancer was dysphagia, which was the case in over 80% of individuals, and um, dysphagia in combination with weight loss in 50% of individuals. Next slide. Right. So in conclusion, all patients with esophageal cancer um, met the NICE guidelines for referral, with only one individual not meeting the guidelines for an urgent referral. And this shows that it is effective in detecting esophageal cancer from direct test endoscopy in patients that meet the guidelines. So for every 50 endoscopies undertaken, one case of esophageal cancer was detective, detected, making an uh, effective intervention given the number needed to test. Um, and as I said, 80% of patients presented with dysphagia and 50% with dysphagia and weight loss in combination, um, confirming this as the predominant red flag presentation. Many thanks. Any questions? Yes, thank you very much indeed. Can, you mentioned esophageal cancer, but the guidelines are for esophagogastric. Did you include the gastrics as well in this? We didn't, no. We, we um, did identify six cases of gastric cancer um, from the... Um, from the um, all the direct tests and um, endoscopies that were carried out, but um, for the, this um, presentation, I've only included the, the esophageal cancer. Because that's quite important, isn't it, to, to, to try and work out that you've actually picked something up. And so yeah. the other question is, is it's along the same lines. Did you, what was the percentage of people where you picked up significant other non-cancerous abnormalities? And how many of the patients coming direct to test were found to have a cancer at subsequent investigations, for instance, a CT scan? So um, one of my colleagues did actually um, look at that um, and we did look at the follow-up that um, individuals um, had. So um, there, were, there were cases where um, cancer was identified um, from CT scan following, um, following endoscopy. However, um, it, like I say, it wasn't esophageal cancer and that's why we didn't include that in our, in our data. Okay, so from my point of view, uh, the, the NICE guidelines are supposed to have a yield rate of about 3 to 4%, yeah. which is essentially where you are sitting. That means, as you have rightly pointed out, we do 49 unnecessary endoscopies for every one that we pick up. There's got to be a better way than that. I'm not certain about your hospitals across the place, but with COVID, everyone's running around like headless chickens because it's called an air, aerosol generating procedure and our access to diagnostics have dropped off. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, 65% of the, the, the referrals were appropriate, but actually one in three um, referrals didn't meet the guidelines for endoscopy and yet endoscopies were still carried out in, in those individuals and in none of those individuals, um, esophageal cancer, was detected every single one of them um, where it was detected met the guidelines for referral. Okay thank you very much. Uh, Liz moving on. Thanks. Thanks for that really interesting stuff and as Neil says affects us all. So the next talk is enhancing responses to current treatment strategies in esophageal cancer a novel approach to not so novel disease with Noel Donlan hopefully. Uh, many thanks for the introduction. 
Uh, hello from Dublin. So the incidence of soft shield cancer, as we all know, is increasing exponentially on a year on year basis with adenocarcinoma, the predominant subtype now in the Western world. Despite, sorry, um, next slide. Next. Uh, despite a multimodal approach, at best only one in three will achieve a meaningful response. With tumor biology and adverse features dictating survival. Next. Next. This is just data which um, we've published from our own center, looking primarily at a soft gel adenocarcinoma, just to highlight how significant nodal disease and adverse tumor features are in dictating survival. Next. As we're all aware, I mean, checkpoint blockades have garnered support in the treatment of some solid tumors, and they're usually reserved for treatment refractory cases in the majority of clinical scenarios. Next. They essentially turn back on the immune system. Next. Promoting a more tumoricidal effect mediated by the immune response. Next. And next. Essentially, what we're looking at today is soft adenocarcinoma carcinoma in terms of the tumor microenvironment and also the lymph node microenvironment. Next. So what we did was we took both lymph node and tumor matched from the same patients in OSC, and we ran a panel of um, checkpoints. So what we found is looking at the different compartments, CD3s, CD4s, and CD8s, we found a significantly higher checkpoint expression in the tumor than the representative lymph node. Next. Because of these findings, we then developed our own experimental design looking at the lymph node. So we essentially mimicked the lymph node ourselves, whereby we took OSE patient whole blood, we isolated T cells and activated them in the presence of immune checkpoint blockers with stimulation, including IL-2. We then added these stimulated lymphocytes to four cell lines representing adverse tumor biology, including a radioresistant cell line, and also that of liver metastases and parental matched lines mm -hmm. from colleagues in the Peter McCallum Institute, and looked at the tumoricidal potential under a variety of conditions. For example, looking at different ratios, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see that it's T cells only, and then we added in with T cells and radiation, and then T cells and immune checkpoint blockers, and then T cells with radiation and immune checkpoint blockade. And across the entire cell lines for both PD-1 and PD-L1 blockers, the data isn't shown here because there's too many to show, it demonstrated that ionized radiation along with checkpoint blockade in the presence of increasing amount of lymphocytes results in higher amount of tumor killing. Next. So essentially what does this data show? It indicates that Number one, conventional radiating dose may not necessarily stimulate the immune system adequately. Next. Hyperfractionation here is demonstrated by doubling the dose, results in a greater immunogenic cell death. Next. And essentially, combining immune checkpoint blockers with radiation, and I go so far as to say that it needs to be checked in the adjuvant setting, Maybe the missing tool in the surgeon's armamentarium in treating local regional disease. Thank you. Thanks for that interesting stuff. So I'm guessing from what you're saying in terms of applying this clinically, it's going to help us work out how much radiation we're giving patients for esophageal cancer. Is that right? Yeah, so I suppose there's two elements to it. One is how much radiation we give, considering radiation therapy has evolved over the past uh, decade or so and is now much more targeted and a much cleaner delivery. And number two, the other thing that needs to be figured out, and this is for all solid tumors, is when to give radiation, when to give the checkpoint blocker, because number one, it may actually radiosensitize a tumor. And number two, the flip side is, you may need to give the checkpoint blocker before you give the radiation, to turn off the immune, the immune system reaction from rejecting it. So it's a double-edged sword, really. So my next question is, what next? Yeah. That's what good. are you planning to do next? And we are, uh, well, we have a lot of other data that obviously I couldn't present today. 
that is suggesting that radiation with that dose is the next step. And um, we're looking to try and get some funding secured that we can do our own trial here. That's, that's the next step. It's a big step, but that's what we're looking for. Brilliant, that sounds good. And Neil's put the question there, I think, to test my um, ability to pronounce uh, drugs. Is is why, yeah. did, why did you choose Pembroluximab? So I did. I've done Pembro, Nivo, and Atezolizumab. So I did Pembro and Nivo, uh, and then Atezo, so that we had both PD-1 and PDL one blockers. Nivo is currently under investigation in uh, a trial with uh, radiation, the first of its kind in Europe. And that's the reason why I presented that data today. But pembrolizumab had pretty much the same results. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Very interesting. Good luck with the rest of it. Well, thank you. <clears throat> we move on to the, the next part, part the, some of the talking posters. And first of all, we have got Irina Stefanova, uh, where the meta-analysis, the impact of bariatric surgery on low back pain. Irina, do you want to tell us all about this? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Irina. I work uh, as a core surgical trainee at the Rosary County Hospital, Guildford. Uh, obesity rates are increasing uh, globally, and this constitutes a significant clinical and public health concern. Whilst there is strong evidence for the impact of bariatric surgery on metabolic and cardiovascular disease, there is less understanding of uh, the effect on bariatric surgery on musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, we carried out this meta-analysis to find out and assess the Im what's the impact uh, of obesity surgery on specifically back pain. Uh, we performed a comprehensive literature search using databases such as Medline, Embase, and also conference proceedings between the years of 1983 and 2019. We searched for studies which specifically used a quantitative measure for the assessment of back pain. And our primary outcome was um, visual analog score for back pain pre and post bariatric surgery. And secondary outcomes were um, change in, um, in uh, body mass index, short form 36 uh, quality of life scores and OSWES 3 disability index scores. We identified seven cohort studies which met our inclusion criteria, and we assessed them for bias and methodological quality using the minus two for non-randomized studies. They were graded as low moderate quality. Um, we calculated standardized mean differences for continuous outcomes and also heterogeneity uh, using chi-squared tests and I-squared measure of inconsistency. Uh, the types of uh, proce bariatric procedures across the studies were mostly urinary gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomies, duodenal switch, um, um, gastric banding, and vertical banded gastroplasty. Uh, the follow-up was between 3 and 24 months across the studies with mean follow-up of 11.7 months. Um, the analysis included in total 246 patients, and uh, our results did confirm that uh, there was statistically significant reduction in the visual analog scores for back pain after bariatric surgery, and also statistically significant improvement in body mass index, uh, SF36 scores, and also ODI scores. So uh, this, you can see this on the, um, on the right hand side uh, uh, on the forest plots. I'm sorry if it's not very, it's, it doesn't really appear very well. Um, that's why we concluded that bariatric surgery does produce uh, significant and quantifiable reductions in low, low back pain. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Does that surprise you? Um, to be honest, uh, I, uh, we, when, we perform, when we were uh, starting on this meta-analysis, we expected that this would be the result. Uh, but what we didn't have is uh, when we performed our literature search is um, something that confirmed that this would be the case. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's something to think about as well because musculoskeletal disorders um, can uh, impair the quality of life of uh, people with obesity quite a lot. And uh, yes. most of the time we only look at uh, things like diabetes, hypertension and other diseases. Absolutely. So most of the studies are actually quite limited in what they follow up. So yeah. can I ask the question differently? Of course, yeah. Are there any other um, uh, musculoskeletal comorbidities improvement? I was thinking more more long term, hip replacements, knee replacements, other sort of weight bearing joint issues, or so is there no data out there? Osteoarthritis is also one of the, uh, one of the other 
um, musculoskeletal disorders that um, I actually read quite a lot about, but we decided to focus on back pain as this was um, sort of less investigators. There were less cohort studies about this. Um, whilst for, for osteoarthritis and um, uh, osteoarthritis and joint issues, um, the, you, you could find more cohort studies published in the, within the liter literature. It is difficult to find uh, what, what sort of primary outcome would you choose in that sense though. Um, I guess total hip replacement and the uh, rate of people requiring operative, uh, uh, operative uh, management of their osteoarthritis would be, would be one, one good point if, uh, you, if someone would undertake a meta-analysis like this. Okay, thank you, Irina. I don't think there's any other questions being put in electronically. So over to you, Liz. Great, thanks. So we've got our final um, poster, which is, or the talking one at least, uh, which is post-esophagectomy and asthmatic leaks, the relationship between primary management and overall outcomes in patients. And we should have, is it Tamina Fashima? Tamini. Tamini, sorry. Okay. So hi, I'm Tamini. I'm a medical student at Leicester. So um, as Liz already said, so this is a um, respect, retrospective cohort study, which was part of a larger tentacle study, which was an international, a currently ongoing international multi-center study. And it's looking at um, anastomotic leaks in patients who underwent uh, esophagectomy. So specifically, um, about 318 patients were isolated over a seven year period um, at Leicester Royal Infirmary who underwent an esophagectomy and developed an anastomotic leak. So additional information was collected according to the patient demographics, um, the operative procedures they had, and then also the identification and treatment of the leak. So the primary outcome parameter was the 90 day mortality and there were various other secondary outcome measures which are listed there. Um, and in terms of the results, so we were able to identify 37 patients out of that group of 318, which gave us an overall leak rate of about 11.6%. Um, when we compare the 30 day mortality rate between the patients who had a leak and the patients who didn't, um, we can see that um, the patients who didn't have a leak was about 3% died within 30 days in comparison to 11% in patients who had anastomotic leaks. So as expected, significantly higher. Um, also, we compared the mean hospital stay um, and it was roughly um, more than double. So 39.5 um, in patients with a leak and 17.85 in patients who did not have it. Um, and then if we focus on that group of patients with the leak again, we can see that roughly it was diagnosed about eight days on average after their initial operation. And the 90 day mortality rate, which is a primary outcome measure, um, is 24.3% in that group. So roughly a quarter of them um, died within 90 days. So sorry, so I actually had um, a table attached in the results, but I realized I had it as an animation. So I'm not sure if it's, oh, there we go. So um, if we actually compare it, it's not very clear, but the initial con, so that's comparing the 37 patients who had a leak and we're comparing the ones who died within 90 days. So the 24% in comparison to the 75% who didn't. And we can see that the patients who died within 90 days were generally older. Um, they had a longer diagnostic time till um, we found out about the leak, but they actually had lower ICU and hospital stays. But that could have been confounded by the fact that a lot of them did have in-hospital mortality. Um, then if we just round up the results as well, we just noticed that um, the 30-day um, mortality, as expected, was significantly higher than the patients who had a leak and didn't. And then also the um, rate doubled between um, 30 days and 90 days, well, more than doubled. So that means most of the patients who actually did die who had a leak died um, between 30 um, and 90 days out. So, yeah. And then more analysis is to come in the tentacle study. It has been derailed excuse me, derailed a bit by COVID. So hopefully we'll get that data soon. Thanks, great presentation. So I think my question from this is a lot of it you'd probably expect in terms of a high mortality with a leak. Is this going to change your management to a more aggressive stance? Um, well, the overall, again, as this is kind of a kind of sub project from the tentacle study, but the overall purpose is to actually um, create a severity score which would correlate um, different types of management with um, the 
the different characteristics of the leak so that we can have um, a bit more information at a pre-treatment stage. So um, in the actual tentacle study and more of in our analysis, we looked at the different types of management that were involved um, in comparison to stenting and um, if the reoperation happened again. So hopefully when all of the data from the different centers are, um, um, are um, sorry, compiled together, then we will be able to get a bit more information about how to adjust the management. Okay, and do you think comorbidities played a role in all of this? Oh, definitely. Um, so that was in, sorry, so I converted a PowerPoint into this um, presentation. So I was trying to just get the key factors. But when we did look at their ECOG score and their ASA score as well, that had a big role in it, in it as well. Great, thanks. I don't know if there are any other questions. So I think that comes to the uh, end of our short papers as well as talking posters um, as ones withdrawn. So it's uh, just flashed up. There's, have a look at the e-posters as well. There's some quite a few interesting ones that are on there. Um, if anyone's got any interesting things to look at. Um, I think that's about it to wrap it up. Unless you've got anything more to add, Neil. Apart well, from the, thank you all. Only two. yes. Thank everybody for coming. And thank everybody for participating in. Please join the last two sessions next week. And um, I hope everyone has a good day. If you can give us our feedback and fill in the feedback forms on this, that would be really useful. Um, and in particular, whether you think that, um, particularly the posters, uh, you have enjoyed it more presenting in this fashion than having your poster up on the wall somewhere. All the very best to everybody and we'll sign off. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye now. Thank you.